Hi, today we are going to discuss A Room of One's Own written by Virginia Woolf. This is a seminal work of feminist theory in 20th century through an unorthodox and highly provocative examination of the social and material conditions necessary for the development of literature. This text investigates the history of women in literature. All literary work is supported by at least these three elements, leisure time, privacy and financial independence. But there are essential to understand the position of women in the literary tradition. Since historically women have consistently been denied access to these essential elements. Wolf explores this concept by launching a variety of thought-provoking societal and artistic critiques. She examines the status of women's literature as well as the status of theoretical and historical research on women. In the first unit, Wolf has been invited to give a speech about women and fiction. She claims that in order to write fiction, a woman must have money and a room of her own. She acknowledges that the scope of her thesis is constrained and uh, it leaves unanswered the fundamental dilemma of the true nature of woman and the true nature of fiction. However, she hopes that at least some of those issues may be clarified by her reflections. The essay's purpose is to explain how Wolf came to her conclusion. She claims that in order to make this case, she needs to go into fiction. I propose making use of all the liberties and licenses of a novelist to tell you the story of two days that preceded my coming here, how bowed down by the weight of the subject which you have laid upon my shoulders. I pondered on it and made it work in and out of my daily life. With this introduction, the narrative portion of the essay begins. The narrator considers the issue of women in literature while sitting on the bank of a river at Oxbridge, a made-up university intended to resemble Oxford and Cambridge. Thought had let its line down into the stream of the mind, where it wanders in the current and waits for the tug of an idea, is how she figuratively expresses her meditations. However, as soon as she begins to eat, she is stopped by the beetle. A campus security officer who enforces the rule prohibiting women from walking onto the grass. Although no very great harm was done, she scrambles back to her rightful position on the gravel path and laments that she has lost her little fish and that's her idea. The narrator thinks back to an essay by Charles Lamb on visiting Oxbridge while she takes in the peace and beauty of her surroundings. Her desire to see the manuscript in person prompts her to visit the library. But she is informed that women are only admitted to the library if accompanied by a fellow of the college or equipped with a letter of introduction. The library is impenetrable and indifferent, resembling a fortress in sharp contrast to the narrator's frailty. She swears angrily, never will I beg for that hospitality again. She observes as members of the university community gather for a service in the chapel, which being distracted by the sound of the organ. She is astonished by the academic environment's exclusivity, viewing universities as a sort of laboratory or museum with its students acting as peculiar specimens with no place in everyday life. The feeling of her exclusion though weighs on her as she waits outside after they have all gone inside. The narrator then muses on the institution's history, focusing in particular on the resources, 
such as labor, money and materials that were used to establish and support it. The alarm clock cuts off this line of thinking. The abundance of wine, desert and excellent company combined with the magnificent meal that was provided at the college produced an overpowering feeling of abundance and uh, optimism. According to the author, the rich yellow light of intellectual discourse, a profound, subtle and uh, underground glow was gradually ignited halfway down the spine, the seat of the soul. The sight of a cat without a tail, which appears strange and out of place in these sumptuous surroundings, diverts her attention. She notices something is off with the luncheon talk and ambience when she sees the abrupt and shortened animal. The narrator switches the scenario to a similar lunchtime party before the war in comparable rooms but different to address the subject of that deficiency. She speculates on the differences in the talks and poetry written before World War I and notes that a significant change has occurred. The difference is that earlier poetry celebrates some sensation that one used to have at lunchtime parties before the war presumably. The romantic visions of a Tennyson or a Rossetti no longer seem feasible in the post-war society. However, the new poetry portrays ideas and feelings that are so shockingly unfamiliar that readers are unable to react to them and with the same comfort of familiarity. Hence, the difficulties of current poetry is a statement that is somewhat deflating. The narrator misses her turn to Farnham, which stands in for the relatively new institution of the women's college while she is considering the issue. The narrator discusses a Fernham meal that falls short of the lavish luncheon earlier in the day. She states that the lighting in the spine does not light on meat and prunes. From this vantage point, everything appears a little less promising and we can observe that diminished privilege is accompanied by a corresponding atrophy of one's sense of power and possibility. That is the dubious and qualifying state of mind that beef and prunes at the end of the week's work breed between them. The narrator leaves the conversation because it is gossipy rather than meaningful and heads to her friend Mary Satan's room with a general sense of unhappiness. They talk about how it was difficult and uh, frequently depressing to garner enough financial and political backing to create the women's institution. The historical support for male universities, which has been constant and generous for centuries, contrasts strongly with the current situation. Uh, when considering how different things might have been, if only Mrs. Seton and her mother and her mother before her had learned the great art of making money and had left their money. The narrator wonders why women have always been so poor, but she's obliged to admit that a high cost would have been involved. There would have been that was the hitch in the argument. No Mary. Additionally, those women were considered property themselves. Thus, law and custom worked together to prohibit them from having any formal property rights at all. Reflections at the end of the chapter focus on the urbanity, geniality and dignity that are the progeny of wealth and seclusion and space, the mental impact of poverty and in particular the effect of tradition and the lack of tradition upon the mind. Of a writer. In an effort to go further into the topic of women and fiction, Wolf chooses not to address it by making cliched comments about well known female authors. She acknowledges that because of the method she has chosen, she may never be able to come to a conclusion or extract a 
nugget of pure truth for her audience to take away. One cannot hope to tell the truth when a topic is really divisive, she explains. Huh? One can only explain how to get to the opinion they do. Wolf continues to thematize the intricate web of connection between truth and fiction, facts and falsehoods and ideas and emotions by using fiction as the medium of her argument. Fiction is likely to contain more truth than fact, she says. Lies will flow from my lips, but there may come some truth mixed up with them. And despite the fact that Wolf is not the I who narrates the story, it doesn't matter what name we give her. She insists her experiences and thoughts serve as the foundation and support of her thesis. A major aesthetic theory of Wolf's already illustrated by narrative situation, art should have a form of incandescence in which Everything that is merely personal burns away, leaving something akin to the nugget of pure truth that Wolf has previously mentioned. This chapter has already begun to accumulate imagery of light and fire that is intended to allude to this form of aesthetic uh, you know, purifying. As the essay goes on, Wolf's aesthetic argument will be expanded upon. However, the Emphasis is socially and materialistically oriented. As Wolf's thesis, the woman must have the money and the space of her own if she is to write fiction. She clearly states this. What are the fundamental social and uh, a material requirement for artistic success to become a possibility? She intends to answer this query in order to challenge the theoretical tradition that holds that women are inherently less valuable than males and place the issue of women and fiction in an impartial and historical context. The specific material depends on the situation Wolf describes. The food, consume, the money spent, the comfort of the lodgings and the time demands schedules recover, reoccur throughout her argument. And uh, her approach, you know, aims to persuade the reader of the profound importance of these physical circumstances for the potential of uh, intellectual and uh, uh, creative activity. Wolf highlights the importance of interruptions in the reflective process as she shares her narrator's opinion on women and fiction. She strengthens her claim that quiet spaces is a fundamental requirement for creative work by dramatizing the consequences of frequent disruptions. According to her, one of the defining characteristics of the history of women's literary accomplishment is the lack of that space and leisure that has historically been provided to them. At last, uh, uh, but not least, according to Charles Lamb, intelligence is characterized by a wild flash of imagination or the lightning snap of genius insights require time to develop. But each time our narrator appears to be on the verge of such an understanding, her thoughts are interrupted, usually by a superior seeking to keep her in her place. On the Oxbridge campus where a man would have been permitted complete freedom, the narrator is confined to a little path. She is also not allowed to go into the university library. These challenges represent the result of an educational culture that severely limits the intellectual exposure of women. According to Wolf, another form of interference with the independence of female mind is being refused access to things, including ideas or buildings. And uh, this exclusion is a more severe form of interruption. It affects not only a single idea of or a moment of introspection, but also a person's lifetime growth or the historical progression of an intellectual tradition. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed uh, the first unit discussion, uh, kind of an analysis I came up with of uh, Virginia Woolf's work. Uh, to, to listen to more such, such stories, such discussions and analysis, you can subscribe this channel and see you in the next episode. Thank you so much.